Good evening. Undeter those who were undeterred by hail and snow are here in great numbers. Welcome. You won't regret it. Uh, you won't regret seeing this film, and more importantly, you won't regret, for those of you for whom it is the first time, you won't regret meeting Minakshi or re-meeting Minakshi Shede. Um, I'm quoting from a recent profile in India's leading newspaper, The Hindu, which had a full page spread on Minakshi, I think this week, Last week. It was last week. And it starts by saying, Minakshi Shetty watches movies for a living, usually on her laptop, often on the move. And I think that's a, a nice way to start <laughs> a profile of Minakshi Shetty, who is one of India's leading film critics, film curators, but has also been someone who has traveled the world promoting Indian films facilitating the transition of Indian films to Western festival audiences and cinema audiences, facilitating the transition of interesting auteur films from all over the, the world to festivals, but also to India. So she has been one of the most important critic curator go-betweens in, uh, in, in the field in which our activity here, our lecture and film series um, uh, situates itself for going on 30 years or actually longer um, among her many appointments or functions uh, Minakshi Shetty has been the lead film critic for the Times of India um, that was your job when we first met I so think you were the unofficial critic, but much published. <laughs> and I remember this was more than 20 years ago. And I remember that you quit when they tried to tell you what to write. And <laughs> not so much, but in, in, in India. So there was pressure from industry circles on the choices you were making, and you decided to leave. And um, that was the times of India's loss, and I think everyone else's gain, the people that you started working with. Um, Menokshi Shetty has been uh, a member of, the, of various Berlinale selection committees for uh, more than a quarter of a century now. She's worked for the Forum, she's worked for the Panorama, she's worked for the main section, um, helping um, the Berlin Olive Film Festival make better choices in their programming, particularly of uh, uh, Indian films, but other Asian film uh, traditions as well. She has published many books, um, um, edited collections. Um, she has, she's also a social activist. Uh, one of her longstanding wonderful projects is that of creating a museum of Dalit culture and, uh, and Dalit history um, along the lines of basically the, the, the Museum of African American History in Washington, D.C., and I think that is something that India, particularly now, would sorely need. Um, and I can also say that one of, my, one of the things that I'm really proud of is that there is an essay that was published that I had the privilege of co-writing with Manokshi Shetty um, 20 years ago on the three versions of The Indian Tomb, um, the 1921 version for which Fritz Lang wrote the screenplay, then the Nazi version, and <coughs> the 1959 version, which became sort of the formative film for every German's notion of India because it was rescreened every Christmas on television, and a, a, a whole generation of post-war Germans felt that India was what was depicted in that film. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> and <laughs> if you really want to know about India, you had better watch films like Devi, which is the one that um, Minakshi is going to um, introduce to us uh, tonight, a film uh, from the early 60s, was as, which, as you will find out, is immensely relevant to today's India. Minakshi, thank you so much for being here. Such a pleasure. And the floor is all yours. Thank you so much for that very generous introduction. Um, Devi, Goddess in a Trap. Uh, my intertext or subtitle for that is Me Too, Why Religion? 
Ein Auge für die Welt, die Filme von Shatajit Rai, that's how it's pronounced in Bengali. An Eye for the World, the cinema of Shatajit Rai. I'd like to thank Vincent Seidega, Ritika Kaushik, Daniel Fairfax sitting here. Please raise your hands. Please give them a very big hand. They've been doing fantastic work for this film and series. Thank you for inviting me to uh, lecture here as part of this enduring legacy of significance of Ray in a post-globalization world. They are the curators of this brilliant and landmark film and lecture series that takes place over 10 months, admirable for its scale and depth. Special gratitude to the Deutsche Film Institute and Film Museum DFF Frankfurt. And this lecture is organized by the TFM, by the Institute of Theater, Film and Media Studies of the Goethe Institute Frankfurt, DFF, in cooperation with CONTRUST, Conflict and Trust in Political Life. I'd also like to thank the Academy Archive. Can I put this out a bit, a little bit? Sorry. Can I put this out a little bit? Does it come out? Just like to connect with you a little more directly. Um, I'd also like to thank the Academy Archive, the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, for this beautifully restored 35 mm print. Uh, I'm very grateful to um, for this opportunity to lecture here, and thank you to each one of you for braving it in really beastly weather. Uh, a few disclaimers. First of all, I'm not at all an academic, so those expecting that I'll have a lecture with a bibliography moving from here to the moon are going to be very sorely disappointed. And therefore, I really value uh, this invitation from this team, despite that, to trust that I'd have some insights worth sharing. And um, the second disclaimer is that there might be some spoilers in this lecture because I wanted to make some points. But I guess spoilers are OK for a film that was made 64 years ago, so apologies nonetheless. I beg your pardon? It doesn't work. You can't hear me. No, it returns to your memory. Ah, okay. Okay. Is it like this? Is it better like this? Okay. Um, a brief intro on Shotajit Rai. Shotajit Rai, 1921 to 1992, was the first director from India to gain global recognition. A polymath, he was a gifted filmmaker, musician, writer, and graphic artist. In a prolific ca career spanning four decades, Shotajit Rai directed 37 films, including feature films, documentaries, and shorts. His films have been at top festivals, including the Cannes, Berlin, and Venice festivals, and he's been acclaimed worldwide. He won several awards, including an honorary Academy Award in 1992. He remains one of the greatest filmmakers of the 20th century. A quick intro to his main theme that he deals with in Devi. Devi is his sixth feature and is an aching tour de force that was warmly received in competition at the Cannes Film Festival. It's based on a Prabhat Kumar Mukherjee story, and its core debate, Faith versus Reason, makes it more complex than the Apu trilogy that he had made just before, while remaining rooted in a family drama. After teenage newlyweds, Uma Prasad Chaudhary, played by Shomitra Chatterjee, and Doya Moi, played by Sharmila Tagore, who was just 14 at the time, they're separated as Uma Prasad goes away to university in Calcutta to study, and Doya Moi dutifully cares for her feudal father-in-law, Kali Kinkar, and even massages his feet. He's played by Chobi Bishash, who's also in the music room. Soon he dreams that his beautiful daughter-in-law is the Hindu goddess Kali incarnate and begins worshipping her. Doya Moi is terrified of being trapped as a goddess, but her father-son showdown melts after she revives a dying child and news of her miracles spread like wildfire. Uma Prasad persuades her to run away with him, but she has doubts that address the core issue in this film. What if she is the goddess and what if she did cure that child? Her inability to cure another sick child results in a grand tragedy. Ray daringly addresses a variation of the Oedipus complex where the father-in-law, by imposing divinity on his beautiful daughter-in-law, in a sense, obtains her for himself. Ray visits the faith versus reason argument again in An Enemy of the People, made much later in 1989. Davy is a film Ray made in 1960 that he directed, produced, and wrote. It's a sixth film after the Apu trilogy, and then uh, came The Philosopher's Stone, and then The Music Room, and then came Devi. He's always had strong women characters throughout his work, but Devi marks a turning point in his feminist sensibility. In this film, you understand the director's outrage at the complete devastation of a young girl's personality and her very existence because of religious superstition and patriarchy. 
Uh, will you let me know if I'm going too fast? Can you follow what I'm saying? It's okay. Thank you. But after Devi, he launches into films where women's personalities shine strongly and are at the core of the film, often stronger than the men's, which we see in his next film, Three Daughters, Teen Konna, and later much more clearly in Mahanagar, The Big City, and Charulata, The Lonely Wife. My response to this film has evolved over the years with my life experiences. Just two years ago, when I was curator for a Ray retrospective at the Toronto International Film Festival's TIFF Cinematheque, it was called Ray, His Contemporaries and Legacy, uh, in 2022, it struck me very forcefully that he was emphasizing how patriarchy and religion can be a fatal combination, and how the film in 1960 was so prescient and prophetic of what India would experience today, where an increasingly potent combination of patriarchy and religion are similarly drowning out all reason and have torched a destructive trail. But today, having seen the film again more recently, I also see that the film is much more about Me Too via religion. At the heart of the film, of course, is a faith versus reason debate. Kali Kinkar, the father-in-law's obsession with religious superstition and the rational westernized son Uma Prasad, who goes to university, tells his father he's gone mad and he wants him to stop this religious charade. Some historical context here. The film is set during the Bengali Renaissance that started in the late 18th century and continued till the 20th century. As the East India Company consolidated its rule, the spirit of Western education and European enlightenment fostered modernist thought and a cultural renaissance. Raja Ram Mohan Roy established the Brahmo Samaj, a monotheistic strand of Hinduism that emphasized Western rationalism and social religious reform and opposed Hindu practices like the caste system, idol worship, which Devi very much talks about, and child marriage, and encouraged women's education and equality, as well as re widow remarriage. Both the families of Rabindranath Tagore, a polymath and a towering icon of Indian culture, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1913, and Shatrajit Rai's families were both Brahmos. As author Bhaskar Chattopadhyay has written about how Rabindranath Tagore strongly opposed religious bigotry, but instead of publicly criticizing religious practices, he requested one of his contemporaries, Prabhat Kumar Mukhopadhyay, a liberal Hindu Brahmin, to write a story about a young woman who became a victim of religious author orthodoxy in the landlord's family in Bengal. Accordingly, Mukhopadhyay wrote Devi, which was adapted for the screen by Shatajit Rai in 1960. The original story is set in 1790, but Ray advances the setting by nearly a century to around 1860, as the modernist social reform ferment gives the story a keen edge and a poignancy. Ray's screenplay sets up a systematic exploration of the conditions leading to the fall of reason and a larger pervasive destruction. Lack of formal rational education, for instance. He brings up... He brings up the value of education initially uh, in a banter between husband and wife, teasing each other as she questions him if someone who's not considered educated, if they do not know English. Here, of course, standing for Western Westernization and reason. We later see that this plot point expands as we see formal education as encouraging reason, science, and rational thought, and being a crucial bulwark against religious superstition. But education is no guarantee of reason, of course. Uh, can we take a look at clip one, please? Thank you. He also explores how religion can be used to exploit a woman not exactly sexually, but to control her mind, her feelings, her body, her very agency. He has very nuanced, sophisticated ways of suggesting an erotic charge or a sexual tension in a relationship of intimacy between the father-in-law and daughter-in-law, even though there is, of course, no direct physical sex between them as such, but probably something equally or far more destructive. As in the pan scene in Charulata, I know a lot of people who... Um, uh, raise your hands, those who've seen Charulata. Super. So I don't know, a lot of people uh, really adore the opening scene, which has her walking in a corridor in a veranda and with that establishes a lone loneliness. A lot of people love the swing scene um, where she's uh, for the first time kind of confessing to her feelings to Amal. Uh, but I really love the pan scene and, and I'll describe it to you in a moment. Um, in the pan scene in Charulata, he suggests an erotic charge again and a sexual tension in a scene in which Charulata throws away a pan made by his sister-in-law for Amol and makes a fresh one for him, uh, 
herself as an offering of apology because her article has been published in a magazine and she fears that her accomplishment will be a thorn in an amorous relationship with Amol and make him insecure. So interesting. He's, you know, he's always so layered, as you'll see in the film, and I'm sure you've seen it before, but he just brings multiple layers of meaning um, to almost every scene that he writes. Here in Devi, in a crucial scene suggesting a variation of the Oedipus complex, the father-in-law, Kali Kinkar, stakes his claim to his daughter-in-law's affection and tender care. He sits in a chaise long covered with a leopard print rug, grandly leaning back as if in business class, while his daughter-in-law, Doya Moi, sits at his feet, massaging them uh, while his feet are placed on a footstool. What struck me very forcefully at a recent viewing last week is how his knees were right open while his daughter-in-law sat at his feet massaging them. She has given him his medicine, got him water, a towel to wipe his mouth, full slave. No wonder he declares that he simply can't do without her. In a very explicitly Oedipus complex way, he insinuates himself into her affections while trying to elbow out his own son out of her affection saying, he doesn't really know your worth. Does he write you letters daily? He makes uh, Doya Mui squirm as she leaves hurriedly at this embarrassing intrusion into her privacy. But as the foot massage scene uncannily echoes the experience I've had as a woman, for instance, viewed visiting a beauty salon for a pedicure in Mumbai. On the very rare occasions I bother going to a salon. I sit in a chair with a person, usually a man, uh, uh, who's sitting at my feet, doing my feet, they, to trim my toenails, file them, put nail polish, and give me a foot massage to round off. During this time, they place my foot on a towel on his knees, so it's comfortable for them to work. But there's a very particular, the very, there's a very particular way that women handle the energy of these intimate moments with a stranger with whom they wish no intimacy. I always keep my knees close together to block any possible energy charge, and women often get busy on their mobile phones or reading some glossy magazine, partly out of boredom and partly to deflect unwanted attention and physical interest, even if subconscious, to keep the energy between our bodies neutral. Sorry, this is a very woman's way off, single woman's way off. Um, you know, these are just very subtle things, but I'm just sharing them with you because that scene hit me so forcefully. So Ray's foot massage scene was revealing in many subtle ways. He dismisses his son as too westernized, but the word he uses is Christian, as if he's too far gone because of it. Indians may argue that the massaging of, of the feet of parents and in-laws and the elderly is a common form of respect and affection. Yes, it is. But see what Ray invests in the scene, in this gesture, and in the scenes that follow. The leopard print, uh, the open knees, the power position of high and low, the putting down of a son-in-law as unable to value her worth, as he does, where of course all he's doing is exploiting her, insisting that she's a goddess, ordering her to play the role that he commands, and moving her to another room as a permanent arrangement when she's unconscious, without her knowledge or permission. In an unspoken way, it also suggests that the goddess probably can't have sex with her own husband as a mere mortal when he visits, and so she has no conjugal rights as a wife, while being totally committed to the father-in-law. Even when the husband suggests eloping, she's too frail to have the power to escape, having become too suspicious and worrying that something can happen to her husband if she runs away as a goddess. Step by step, Ray shows how religion and superstition strips human of all reason and rationale. The foot massage is also, to me, a very me-too moment of sexual exploitation of a woman who is innocent, vulnerable, dependent, and helpless, with hints of a Stockholm syndrome, when she later tells her husband that she can't run away because her father-in-law can't do without her. She's unable to protest, and later, even when, she, even when he decides that she's an incarnation of the goddess, an unforgivable transgression that delivers her almost entirely in his personal control. But since he's driven by religion, the connection to divinity thereby renders him unimpeachable, but leaving a tragic trail for the entire family. It's not just a question of a foot massage. Later, by making the teenage girl a Devi, he summarily imposes a divinity against her will, puts her on a pedestal while in fact stripping her of agency altogether, and even taking away her privacy. Her life is now a public spectacle, all day surrounded by priests and devotees chanting prayers with cues of sick people, sick people hoping for a miracle that stretches till the horizon. He even moves her out of her bedroom and into another room closer to the shrine, possibly easier to control her movements and monitor her, as she's further isolated from the family, from her husband, her sister-in-law, and a little nephew, Koka. Isolation is the common strategy of control freaks. Let's see that, footing, that telling foot massage scene. 
uh, when Doya Moi's own husband, outraged by this religious charade, persuades her to elope with him, and she reluctantly agrees, and they're walking among tall reeds to the river. And she has a doubt, which I mentioned before, what if I am a goddess and that boy was cured because of me? She wails, confused. Without the benefit of formal rational education and surrounded by religious mumbo jumbo all day, she herself lapses into superstition and worries that her husband may be cursed if she leaves now. She's just a 17 year old teenager who has no worldly experience nor maturity to know herself. She's wet cement that everyone walks all over her. Please don't ask me to leave, she begs, as they return marking yet another milestone of the fall of reason. The scene is particularly haunting because for me it's a kind of reverse of the scene in Pothir Panchali, The Song of the Road, Ray's first film, of the joyous discovery of seeing a train for the first time by the two village kids, Opu and Durga. It's a sunlit scene with these white cash flowers, grasses nodding in the breeze, whereas here cinematographer Shubrota Mitra films them as they vanish, defeated, and shoulders bowed and into tall, dark grasses, and, and then into total darkness as melancholia grips your heart. The last scene I want to discuss is one where Koka, Daya Moi's adored nephew, is seriously ill. His mother summons the family doctor, but the doctor hesitates, and he suggests letting the resident goddess cure him instead. He wants to be sure that his father-in-law knows that he's been invited home to cure the child, careful not to incur Kali Kinkar's wrath. Only when the child's mother breaks down, as Koka has not had a drop of water for long, the doctor reluctantly agrees to give the child medicine, but still insists that the child be cured by divinity as well, uh, rather than medicine. It's the doctor's surrender, the last bastion of reason, to fall to blind faith and superstition. And when Doya Moi is unable to cure her adored Koka, it results in a grand tragedy. A lot of innocents pay a high price for the blind religious faith of a senile patriarch. Uh, maybe we can see the doctor's clip. Thank you. There are no true villains in Debi. While clearly pointing out the exploitation of a vulnerable young girl being footballed between her stubborn, unyielding arguments of her religious father-in-law on one hand and the westernized rationalist husband on the other, the father-in-law seems to be genuinely acting on a dream of a senile old man, and all his actions seem subconscious rather than intended to destroy his daughter-in-law or family. But in the end, it's also a woman in the family who holds up the rationalism of the household. You just saw it in the scene now. It's a sister-in-law played by Karuna Banerjee. She remains the voice of reason in the family, unconvinced by the charade of divinity, and ironically, ends up paying the biggest price. Even her own husband, Tara Prasad, the priest, the household help, and all the villagers fall at her feet instantly, as instructed and unquestioningly. I also wanted to draw attention to the use of the word ma. It's a loaded word, and Ray exploits its many nuances subtly, allowing it also to cover up wrongdoing. Ma is essentially mother, I think, in a lot of cultures, but it's also used in Devi as the, uh, for Devi, the mother goddess. However, it's also a term of endearment for a baby or a child, and it's how Kali Kinkar uses Ma with Doya Moi, using it up as a term, using it as a term for goddess, for little mother, and as a child, which she is. And the mixing up of all these allows and covers up many transgressions. Also, Doya Moi is childless, but shares a deep maternal bond with Koka, her nephew, who's very fond of her and won't eat, bathe, or sleep without her, also playing into her role as a quasi mother. The film is also about tradition and capitalist power because nobody dare oppose the rich zamindar landlord. The whole village is ready to fall and you know play on his instructions at one gesture from Kali Kinkar. Ray's visual metaphors and shorthand is exemplary. Of the many that he uses in this film, uh, I would note, for example, uh, as you watch the film, there's a scene uh, many scenes where Doya Moi is talking to a parrot. And the parrot is not in a cage, he's in an open, on a stand, and yet he never flies away. So it's really a fantastic metaphor. Doya Moi is not literally caged, but is unable to fly. And another one is where the film opens with the blank face of the sculpture of the goddess Durga, an avatar of the goddess Devi, that gets a vision uh, when she's, of course, painted by the, by the sculptor. She gets vision a gaze and a third eye on the forehead representing enlightenment and insight. But the film ends with the blank gaze of the sculpture again, as if her vision, gaze and understanding, insight and worldly experience is blank and her experience of marriage in the Kali Kinkar household and the imposition of divinity has left her with a blank slate of mind. It is terribly tragic and Ray, so much, Ray says so much while saying so little. 
As most of India is rousingly celebrating the inauguration of the Ram Temple in Ayodhya next week on January 22nd, that was built over the Babri Masjid or Babar's Mosque, a holy place of prayer for Muslims that was willfully destroyed in full view of the world and media, with the Supreme Court, the judiciary, the that the police and media ensuring a smooth passage of the building of the Ayodhya temple by right-wing Hindus, it marks the triumphant the triumph of emphatic triumph of religion over reason in India yet again, with elections following soon after. The future of our great nation is being built on faith and not reason or scientific progress that ensures that the masses have access to basic needs such as good health, education, jobs, clean air, clean drinking water, housing, but instead is a future based on the celebration of one faith over the destruction of another and it is not the India I have grown up in, and it is an India whose future remains a matter of concern. Thank you. Welcome back to the podium, um, Menakshi. Um, You did uh, um, connect in your concluding remark um, this film, which you described very convincingly as an indictment of superstition and and let's say the sort of the sexist undertow um, of a certain type of superstition to contemporary India. Maybe we can also get back to that. But I want to perhaps start with something else that you talked about, namely the <coughs> uh, the Brahmo Samaj as a source of, uh, of course, Tagore's um, worldview writing, artistic, philosophical vision, and its connection to, uh, to Ray's uh, own vision. And um, I remember a text about the Brahmo Samaj where, um, I mean, there's a, there's a strong connection to proto-socialist reform movements in Britain <coughs> in the 19th century and the Brahmo Samaj, and there's, a, there's an exchange. And, and um, the, one of the authors I've been reading um, said that if if the Western reform movement was focused on the proletarian as the figure that needed redemption, in the Brahmo Samaj it was the woman. So the it's very much a a, a movement, spiritual renewal, uh, a movement of spiritual renewal, uh, a, a, a reform movement that sort of tries to marry enlightenment rationality with a certain type of Indian sp um, <coughs> spirituality, but but in a in a way the focus of social action is always uh, uh, the the oppressed woman, and 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 the narratives in the literature of the second half of the nineteenth century, in Tagore and others, um, uh, are typically very interesting layered female characters built around female characters. So in a way, that film really continues in, in that tra tradition. It continues in the tradition of Sarat Chandra and, <clears throat> uh, and Tagore himself, of course, if you think of something like Joker Bali. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm interested in how, if, if you could say something more about that connection. For a very interesting question. Um, uh, for me, what's interesting is that it actually started with a, as I understand it, with a political impulse. It's to do with historical fact, uh, historical events with the East India Company coming in and wanting to have an, ad an administration in India, which is why they introduced Western rational education and so on with science and all of that. And actually, from from what I've read, it's actually the missionaries that came in who took education even further, and especially of women. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas the administrator was more interested in you know guys running the system, but missionaries for their own re own reasons, including religious reasons, uh, had a, a much greater impulse and a determination to uh, spread spread education at the lowest level, and especially including women. And this connected with 
this kind of uh, self um, self critical impulse within Hinduism through the Brahmo mm. uh, Samaj and other sects, which were questioning what religion really means in India and what meaning it has, and this kind of force of rational of Western rationalism forced them even more to see it with greater clarity where we were lagging behind in terms of religion, and to be more self critical. Actually, I think so. Mm. And the fact that, uh, so since, uh, as I mentioned, the story was actually set in, he, uh, Tagore asked his friend to actually write about this because he felt uh, maybe that d a direct attack might not have the consequence that he was yeah. hoping for. And that as a story uh, with more emotionally layered thing, uh, you can, of course, talk about a story with much more layered meaning than just, okay, you guys are the bad guys or this is terribly wrong but you can invest it with much more meaning and nuance. And he requested him to write it, which I was not aware of earlier, mm -hmm. yeah. um, that it was a really direct consequence of Tagore's request. And um, Ray, of course, had an interesting relationship with Tagore and his work. He, uh, his father, Shukumar Ray, knew Tagore quite well personally. Yeah. And uh, Tagore had, uh, Shatujit Rai had initially studied at Shantini Ketan, which is kind of utopian university, um, uh, in Bengal that he was hoping to <laughs> change the world in a, in a certain uh, naturalistic way, uh, studying under trees and so on, and a very uh, emphasis on a humane education than only sitting in classrooms and mugging up stuff. But Ray had already, um, he was quite young uh, when he went there, uh, maybe teenager, early 20s. Mm -hmm. He had yes. already been working in an ad agency and learning Hindustani classical music, Western classical music, doing ads and graphic and fonts and stuff. And then suddenly he was, you know, he had spent time at Shantini and he got bored very quickly and didn't actually complete his education there. But he had an exposure and an understanding of another way of education and life and rationality and so on. Uh, so I think he, so he set this period, this set the story much later than it was, than the original story was set in a time where these rational forces were much more keenly self-critical which gave it uh, a deeper basis for mm -hmm. the father-son confrontation. I think basically that was it, actually. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the original version of the story is set in the late 18th century, which is sort of when the British really start to um, subjugate um, in India into what was to become the empire. And then the 1860s, of course, is... is uh, the period of when, when, of the transition to the Raj, mm -hmm. and and the, the Sepoy Rebellion uh, in 1857, but that also coincides with the emergence of the Brahmo Samaj, yeah. which is also yeah. in 1870. So that that's uh, that's really interesting. Do we have questions from the audience or statements? Yeah, Danny, please. Um, I couldn't help while watching a film but think of Audet by Dreyer uh, because both films are essentially governed by this hypothesis or like two competing hypotheses. One, like religion, is it is it real or is it a delusion? Uh, and in, is, it, is, it, is, this, is this idea that she's a goddess real or is it a delusion? And in Audet it's, does this madman who thinks he's Christ actually is he actually Christ or not and in order he turns out to actually be Christ he performs a miracle he brings someone back to, you know brings some kind of uh, his sister-in-law I guess back in uh, back to life uh, and this film is kind of like the anti or dead in a way it says no it's a delusion <laughs> like it's very very firm on this question like this is insanity it's a kind of mass insanity uh, and don't buy into it uh, so I don't know. I wonder if you made that connection, or if you thought about. <laughs> For me, it's really, uh, you know, it's all this layering of the this visual metaphors is just. Uh, I don't know if I I haven't seen this film, but uh, what strikes me very powerfully is right, like even the last scene, right? The the goddess is blank again after, and you know, there's so much of that, like right at the beginning. I'm sure you would have noticed, like at the moment of this um, this great celebration of Durga, of uh, during the Durga Puja, is the sacrifice which we don't see. It's off screen, and he brings his knife, uh, his sword down on, which is presumably a goat. You don't see that, and the next edit cut is a first, uh, you know a celebration of crackers, of firecrackers, and a big celebration that drowns out the sacrifice. And the next cut is to 
Sharmila uh, Tagore Doyamoyi, who's melancholic. She, she's like seeing what is in front of her and not part of the, so she's always outside the system, but, and then after this image of the blank goddess and then the eyes coming and this third eye, and after all of this, you're back to the blank, like a, a repara zero. You're just back at zero on this blank slate again. So uh, I, I think she's, he's just saying so much more by these very powerful metaphors. And that one edit card, for me, it's a killer. You know, it's really, India is this so rara mood, celebrating, 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 great temple. That temple is going to touch the skies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and really not looking at what's on the ground. And uh, that edit cut is like, for me, a killer, killer cut. Like this, a sword coming down and firecrackers going up in the sky. It's just so powerful and saying so much about that, that the celebration is drowning out all reason, other than all the other layers that he's bringing in. Yeah, you want to add to that, maybe? Yeah, maybe, maybe just a footnote, but Ritika can probably add to that. Um, <clears throat> I mean, uh, the question you're implicitly posing is, was Ray influenced by Dreyer? Or is this is the film a response? Um, and I was going to say it's 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 not an unsafe assumption that he knew the film uh, because uh, so much of the European cinema of the twenties, thirties, forties came through Kolkata and the film clubs, and particularly the film club that he helped animate. Um, that. Um, it's always safe to assume that there was a fairly comprehensive knowledge of, of also Western film history, in addition to, you know, Bengali literature and theater and art and and cinema. Um, it's quite possible. I mean, what's what's interesting is in the in the scene that you so wonderfully introduced and analyzed the foot massage scene. <clears throat> you also highlighted this. Uh, the father t says, uh, sort of disparagingly describes his own son as Christian, and and that that is, uh, I would say, but you can enlighten us more on this, uh, uh, a sort of a, a reference to the sort of the precarious status of Christianity as an element of uh, certain forms of the Brahmo. Um, you know, there, there's this rational religion conversion moment, but a lot of the Brahmos who found Christianity then reverted back to Hinduism at some point in their life. So it's not, um, you know, the, the Christianity that he's referring to is not the kind of Christianity that's, that we see uh, emerge as the result of successful mission or missionary work in, in other parts of the non-European world. So it was very conscious um, borrowing of certain tropes of Christian religion that became element of the Brajo, uh, the Brahmo philosophy, but could then also be abandoned again. And and <coughs> and so that I read that reference as sort of a point ab about the the pseudo Western uh, superficial philosophical attitude of of um, of the sun and in that sense you know dreyer was very much uh, a, a christian uh, film director and this this was a, a, someone who struggled with his faith and with questions of religion <coughs> um i wouldn't say that was race problem at all <laughs> He was, he's, he's much more a classical, you know, he's much, he's, vo he's Voltaire to Dreyer's Kierkegaard. Actually, he does bring up the point in the end. Of course, this guy is like saying, you know, this is a reward for my 40 years of devotion. Uh, so it's not like, it was only the dream. He gives a little backstory to that. But also the, not the lawyer, the, the guy in the uni, uh, he says, but you know, she can't say anything. But why? Why can't you do something about it? And he has no answer, right? So, all the the Western, the Christian, whatever, the rational thought. Uh, for me, that's why, in a sense, it was really after all of this, it's still somehow for me back to money, of him controlling the finances and everyone being dependent or too lazy. Now this guy's okay. He's at uni. He's a student. But the other brother, presumably the older brother, uh, who 
immediately falls at his feet. I presume because they're all just fat leeches living off his money is my impression. I don't know for a fact. But and yet his wife, who's presumably not well educated but well enough to write a letter, uh, she just sees through this nonsense. So as of course education is no guarantee of anything, let alone reason. But Ray underlines that, right? On both sides that the the this wife of her um, the sister in law who holds the ground and the educated, bright, westernized Chris Tusan uh, being in the end quite useless. I mean, he bows down, he gives it to his wife for different reasons, but he doesn't fi have the guts to fight his dad either. So it's actually messing up all sides, like saying that nothing is black and white, and I think that's really to his credit because he gives us so much to mull about because he doesn't, he shows you different sides. You know where his, I think you know where the uh, the director's sympathies lie, but he gives you reasons for each one, each one's motivation, including the father-in-law, who's supposedly the villain. And yet, it's it's hard to simply see him for me only as a villain, right? It's mm. uh, he gives it that nuance, and that's why I think it's so creditable. I think. If I may add one little note to that. Um, one thing that always stri strikes me about that film is how uh, Ray handles the house and the architecture. I mean, it's uh, uh, they're zamindars, so they're wealthy landowners, and they live in a palace. But we never see the full palace. We never see the palace from the outside. <coughs> and <coughs> to, uh, sorry, what we're seeing is, of course, is the standard. The, the key architectural element, element uh, the veranda that connects the living spaces. And then the, the rest of the building, the, the columns and the, the staircases are always shown in such a way as to make them indistinguishable from temple architecture. They're just fragments of a big imposing architecture that can be either uh, sort of worldly the, uh, the ruler's palace, but also it can also be read as a, as a temple, and that kind of ambiguity, I think, is is very important. And and so the economy, as you said, is always at the background, and in a way, they're all compromised and lazy because, you know, he, there's this conversation at the beginning with with the guy who's in love with a widow and who knows he's going to be disinherited, and then uh, the the Shumitro uh, character says, "I'm going to talk to your father." And it's basically about keeping your line of inheritance. Mm -hmm. And even though he's, you know, learning to to earn a diploma that would allow him to earn his own keep, he has no plan to do so. It's basically he's he's headed for the the life of the uh, the inheritor of a large uh, large estate. And 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 so it's th th those things are very very subtle and and the kinds of moral ambiguities and the characters I totally agree with you are are, are very layered. We have a statement from you. You wanted to say something. You moved on the discussion now. I wanted to say something about uh, uh, the point before. Uh, I'm not so sure whether uh, this girl being a goddess is just a delusion. Uh, contrary to uh, the Christ figure in Audit. Um, she is made not just some goddess, but she is made a reincarnation of Durga or Kali, who has uh, visually, obviously, in every statue normally, two sides, a creative one and a destructive one. The destructive one is visible. Uh, in one hand, she has a sword, and in the other one, uh, a skull. Um, so this is what she does in this film. She gives life to one child and brings death to another one. Marvelous observation. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Please. If we look at these two sides of religion, we can say a similar thing also about Christianity. So Christianity is twofold. If we look at Switzerland, for example, the great cities open to the world, they are, they are Protestant, while superstition in Switzerland has retreated into the hills and the mountains. And the same 
is also true for Germany. So when the Protestants, when they rebelled against Catholicism, they had the belief that they could do away with superstition and then they would um, retrieve a rational form of Christianity. And I think that's also the project of the Brahmo Samaj. They became Christian, when they became Christians, I think they became Protestants and then they um, moved back into Hinduism in order to get rid of the irrational stuff, but um, with the hope that they would retrieve um, the rational aspects um, of, of Hinduism. And I think in the beginning of the movie, you see this very clear. In the beginning, we have only the face of the idol, like it comes from the sculptor. And then in the next step, the painter is doing their, their work. And then in the third step, all kind of ornaments and clothes um, are added to the idol. And this is almost like um, Ludwig Feuerbach um, explaining that the gods are created by, the, by people, um, not the other way around. But then the movie goes one step further it's not enough just that the idol um, is created by by craftsmen and then worshipped by specialists as a as a as a god goddess, but then a girl um, is declared made a goddess, and um, Ray shows this. Um, <coughs> This step-by-step -step process, how um, how gods or goddesses are not don't exist by themselves in heaven, but they are crea created by um, social forces and um, social con conditions. And in the end, he's closing the movie also with with the idol, with the face of the idol before it is painted, um, showing showcasing how the idol or even the goddess is a human creation. Um, the <laughs> yeah, this could be, this could turn into a very long evening um, because you're talking to a Swiss Protestant mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure I agree, by the way, with your geography of rationality and superstition there. Um, but that's a long story. Um, the, the I, I think one, one of the things that you're highlighting that's important is that the Brahma Samaj is an urban phenomenon, largely, but it's also an upper caste phenomenon. I mean, look at the names of all these people. They're all Brahmins, and they're land-owning Brahmins, and they're rich, and you know, the, the countryside city divide is one where the, the wealth comes from the countryside, but the money is being spent in Kolkata, and they have these big houses in, 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 in town as well. Um, so, yeah. I mean, it's uh, the, the, let me just put it this way. It's a great observation, but I think we would have to have a very long conversation to, to, to spell it all out. And we have two more statements um, that may be contributions to this or lead somewhere completely different. Hi. I just wanted to say that I feel that it's so uh, contemporary, the film, because I feel that women, even in India today, are completely imprisoned by uh, either having to be the receptacle of all purity in the world or being shunned. So there's always this fear at every moment in every decision that every woman that I know takes of either continuing to hold on to that purity and play that role or then uh, having to feel shunned. And I felt that she felt that time and again, time and again, time and again through the film. And in that sense, it's so contemporary. Yes, thank you for, for the observation. Hi, um, thank you for staying for the long night. But um, I was wondering if you guys could comment on um, the, the, the um, so I observed that most of these houses or the appearance of wealth was actually to do with um, colonial houses with the big chandeliers, the marble floors. So obviously this one to be, um, this idea that to appear rich or to appear powerful, there is this idea that um, they need to acquire this, uh, the, the look of, 
being westernized but also there is that fear of becoming westernized like how he mentioned about his son becoming too christian so i was wondering if you guys could comment a bit on this anxiety they feel on wanting to acquire the material things from a western country but at the same time feeling the fear of becoming uh kind of um interiorly um having western ideas i was wondering if you guys could comment about it thank you <laughs> that's a really interesting observation i think uh, there is like a fundamental thing which i think is in many cultures at least eastern cultures middle east everywhere to that west acquiring western elements is like the thing that establishes how superior you are in different ways material ways clothes or whatever and i think this is to do partly also with the setting of the film with uh, with the coming of christianity uh through the missionary so it was interesting it's the contradiction at many levels including that it's although the the east india company just wanted guys to run the system they just wanted minions who'll do the boring job for them while they would sit and drink tea and um, cucumber sandwiches but the missionaries had a different intent for to being partly religious but they were much they were doing the much more work on the ground actually and of course i'm guessing you know there would have been a religious agenda as well so i think there are contradictions at every level but the point about uh, acquisition of material things to do with western i think that continues very much today in india and i think around the world in general oh i've been i've been to new york or you just drop things you know i'm just back from la or whatever wearing shoes i mean that i think is a very long uh, <laughs> a long history to that mm. but uh, to, uh, just come back quickly to the point that connects yours and uh, the observation that Vincent's made earlier so we just see literally as i can remember just one scene of the palace at a distance uh, uh, when they're trying to run away kind yes. of okay. but uh, the 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 thing about the shrine so this is a traditional thing in many parts of india traditionally not so much now but there still is like in my grandmother's house there was so there is a room a big room called the devghar is the house of god so that was a big part of the house it wasn't some like in my house <laughs> i don't have like in my shelf space along with my books have like you know one tiny photo of god and like a ambed <laughs> kar little sculpture next to that he's just one of so i'm not really terribly religious at all as you can probably say, guess i'm very spiritually inclined but not religious at all you have to drag me to a temple uh, if you have to but uh, this devghar is a very traditional thing in my grandmother's house we had one of the largest rooms in the house was for god so the sh you know not only was there a temple like a proper thing but oh my god we drove her crazy when we were kids we'd go there in the may holidays to a place called dharwad where my uh, grandmother lived and she would like have this bath early morning a head bath as it was called like all of your body and then she'd say these prayers so till the prayers were finished we couldn't touch her and if we touch just like this she'd go oh my god she'd become impure she'd have to have a bath again so me and my sister were complete chipmunks we spent all day waiting for her to come out and then touch her again but she would actually go and bathe again and this is very common in an older maybe one or two generations ago uh, this insane sense of purity which he was also referring to and of course women i can't think of one guy who went and had a second bath because some kid touched him but you're so right it's the women who are the keepers of all this purity shit and you know it connects with so much that's going wrong in the world today in many many cultures this whole shit about honor killing and Uh, it's definitely not an islamic monopoly <laughs> hindus and a whole lot of other cultures hang on to this notion of of men controlling uh what constitutes purity in a woman and who will monitor it and who will decide etc cetera, etc cetera. so this is just one more i think of uh, one more element of patriarchy which you see constantly through all this film so it's directly connects with what aditya was saying a little while earlier also yeah yeah ready to go please I think I was really uh so moved by your comment about how prescient the film feels today. And um I guess what I was thinking was also about how Ray makes it prescient himself by um uh not letting there be a before and after between the temporality that he's working with, right? So of course this is from a very specific histori historical period. It's a period drama but for some reason we don't feel it that way there is yeah. something about it that just hits so differently yeah. right and uh from all the comments that we've been gathering today it feels like uh it's even more prescient now which <laughs> like what kind of a statement is that like for this film and then to think about like can we have a film like this now 
I think that's also another thing to think about, right? Like um, the kind of critique that it's offering uh, with this refusal for um, uh, religious dogma and blind belief, you know, like there's a uh, that idol at the end kind of like seems to signal that kind of blind belief, right? Like blind faith. And how um, uh, the film doesn't let you get away with that. Uh, this is in the past and then there is a future that is of progress, especially by making the reformer figure so like useless. Yeah. Like what is he doing? Yeah. Like you know, like yeah. um, it's interesting. Like how unsympathetic mm -hmm. towards him Ray seems to be, and um, how useless a figure he becomes in the film. That um, uh, even towards the end, it's because she wants to run out, and of course she's right. gone mad. But yeah. it's of course like he doesn't even have control over her. Then like Absolutely. you know, it's like so interesting. Like. Um, where he comes as the savior figure, but um, uh, but to me, like also, that felt like the kind of um, uh, refusal to not let this kind of um, future be um, separated from these continuities from the past, like how they are always in kind of this um, intertwined kind of a connection. And uh, anyway, I just wanted to make that statement that it seems like it would be hard to get away with a film like this even now. You know, it feels like it wouldn't work. Like. Yeah. Anyway, but I was wondering, like you, you know, have uh, you're so familiar with like what kind of films are actually able to circulate now? Like, if uh, you could also speak about like what um, um, what do we make this like six, like how many years now? Did you say sixty four years, years the past the film? Like, how do we make sense of where we are now? You know, like with a film like this, just I don't know. Any thoughts you have on that in terms of filmmaking? Like, what do we do with that? Fantastic observations. Thank you for that, Ritika. But really, I, I'll, gi I'll answer with a kind of a counterpoint. So um, last year, I was also working with the Toronto Film Festival uh, uh, as an advisor for South Asian film. And they had selected a film called Punjab 95 by Hani Trehan. And uh, at some point, there was news. I mean, I had known, of course, it was selected, but uh, I have to wait till it's officially announced in a press release, etc. And very quickly, the news came that, oh my god, this film has been dropped. So the press were like, what, 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 what happened? And they had assumed that Toronto had dropped it. And there was a little puzzle. And uh, some of the journalists who made the effort found that, no, the producer had withdrawn and said, what? Like, you'll actually get into Toronto and then withdraw. Like, So I, I can't give you too many details, but to say that there was reasons why, uh, I mean, he was, of course, thrilled. And his production house was thrilled to be at Toronto. And there were larger forces that didn't want the film to be there. And uh, I met him recently. Um, uh, we met at lunch, and I, I, I said, like, what is the latest status? So the film had been, the, this film had gone to the censor board, who asked him to make 21 cuts. And I said, do you have any film left other than the credits after you make 21 cuts? It was, 75. was also some, I mean, lots of numbers floating around. And then, so. Look at the pain of taking even one cut. So if you want to make a cut, like he says something to me and that dialogue is cut, you have to, sometimes there isn't a direct link to what three sentences later. So sometimes you have to get all the artists to dub again. You've got to call them from different parts of the world and <laughs> India where they are to actually, you, I don't know if you had to shoot connecting bits. It's like practically making a film again. It's not just snip, snip and you know, cello tape. After he made that, he gave them the film that had been, uh, line by line, what they said, implementing. And guess what was their response? They gave him a list of 13 more cuts. So I'm saying there's no end to this, frankly, right? The, the more you give in, <laughs> uh, it's just going to get like this. So I, I, the film has been lying in the archives and is on YouTube, this film, Devi. Uh, but I think if this conversation reminds us that it's relevant, then it would definitely be banned. But as long as it's just lying there quietly in some archives collecting fungus, people are quite happy, right? This kind of conversation gives it a new currency and reminds us how relative, uh, relevant and prescient it is. And then it would definitely be banned forever. So I think for me, I would shut up, but <laughs> <laughs> shutting up is a good way to hopefully give it some life, I would think. This conversation is being recorded and yeah. will be streamed via YouTube, and then that will be the end of Davy. Okay, my lips are zipped now. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for coming in this sweater. Uh, Minoxi, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. And uh, <coughs> thank you.
really to all of you for making it so worthwhile. The team that invited me, but also each of you. Very grateful. Thank you so much. Have a lovely evening. Thanks. We'll continue our conversation next week with the last screening in the winter term. Uh, Danny Fairfax will be the speaker. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we'll resume in the summer um, in Tell April. Tell us the film. Lovely. Yeah. You should come to that as well. You'd have it. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Sure. Hope to see you all next week. And uh, Thank be you. careful on the way home. There's still a lot of <laughs> snow and ice on the ground. And <clears throat> some people don't walk on the sidewalks when there's so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Much. Thanks. Good night.